Okay, let's get started. This is actually lecture two. Last week we had lecture one, but we really didn't talk about Oracle at all. We talked about the class and how to access the course materials and what databases were all about, stuff like that. So today I'm actually going to give you an overview on creating and managing database objects. And I have to start out by saying that Oracle, although they call themselves an object-oriented database, and we have objects that we create, we manipulate them, we really aren't talking about object-oriented programming. That was the previous class. <laughs> this is Oracle. This is more of a relational database programming style. I'm not going to go through relational databases versus hierarchical databases versus all of the other options you have out there, which aren't too many of them, actually. Um, that's lecture 2A. So if you're looking at the video PowerPoints, or not the, in the uh, bhacker.com website, this is 2B, which is really lecture 1 if you think of it that way, and uh, talks about and starts out with the concept of the database object. You don't have to have Oracle installed at this point to understand this lecture. I'm going to give you a lot of general theory in terms of database management, database objects. So in Oracle, an Oracle database consists of multiple user accounts. It's a client server database. And normally, the system would be installed on multiple computers. We'd have a database server. In the old days, actually, NT was very popular for Oracle. Nowadays, there's no NT anymore. <laughs> so now we have uh, Linux, Unix, actually, mostly a Unix server is pretty popular, especially because a lot of databases are now internet enabled. And Oracle makes interfaces, and Oracle itself can run as an internet database. But what we're looking at is a client server mm -hmm. environment where we have an Oracle server, and that really is what we're talking about in this particular class, is the server component. And then we have a client, and the client connects to the server. Many clients simultaneously connect to the server. And we use the database services. Well, what are the database services? They're database objects. So in essence, when you're installing like, the express version, which is what you're getting, you're downloading about two gigs worth of data, which is a lot of stuff. And you're installing it on one computer, one computer alone, usually an XP computer. You've got both the server and the client interface all connecting together on the same computer. But unfortunately, Oracle doesn't give you very much client control. Most of the client interfaces through applications and through front ends, either through a web front end, an HTTP protocol, either through an application. Oracle's great, has drivers for Visual Basic, Visual Studio, .NET, a lot of Windows related stuff, not really supported client-wise on a Mac. But there's growth in that in the future. There's a new growth in Java connectivity for it. And there's new Java tools, because if you haven't noticed in the past, Oracle was Oracle. And then we had Sun who had Java. Now Oracle owns Java. Now we're seeing more Java come into Oracle, which is great, because starting with 11G, now we see Java interfaces. We had JDBC. We had other Java components. But now we're seeing more support, which is good. So I'm going to hopefully, towards the end of the course, kind of tap on some of those features a little bit after we get through a bunch of the other stuff. But uh, for the most part, if you've used Oracle before, it's just like any other client-server database. Once you've got the server loaded, you have to figure out, well, what am I going to use it for? Well, you're going to create objects. You're going to have tables. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, or what are these objects? User accounts, tables, views stored pr programs, procedures, processes, all the stuff that comes with it. So an object is pretty much everything. And uh, each account owns a database object. So we create, in fact, the install does it for us. In fact, when you start installing it, what ends up happening is they don't make that install for novice people. They make it for, like, make experts. So there's a bunch of prompts. Leave everything on the defaults. If you're not running the video and you're going to do it on your own, download 11G. Leave everything on the default, so create a default database object. <laughs> and you'll have a default user account that's set up. And then we're going to grow it from there, essentially, as we start learning more about Oracle. But in terms of the objects, our main primary concern are tables. We store our data into these tables, and we take these tables and we run SQL on them. So a good majority of the class is going to talk about SQL and tables. And queries, because what do you do with a database? I mean, you build a couple tables, you build a design, and then you run queries on that particular table. And the queries is you know, basically the what, you know, commands you're talking to the database. So the server sits out there, and it runs, and it just sits there and doesn't do anything at all. 
And it's up to the clients to actually connect to it through the application protocols to have the functionality exist. And Oracle is nothing more, well, I like the word Oracle, actually, because it, it's kind of self-explanatory. It's an Oracle. <laughs> it's a being. And it's an object. It sits out there as a knowledge base. It's a resource. It's like one of the best information resources that exists out there, actually. And so the query is the command that we're going to perform. It's the operation of the database on the object to either create, modify, view it, delete it, manipulate it in some fashion. It's SQL, Structured Query Language. Um, if you're not familiar with the terminology, it's used on relational databases. You can actually use SQL in non-relational databases as well. Mm, it's kind of a primitive language. It's been around since the 70s or so. It's gotten through many different manipulations. Nobody owns the language. It's a language that's used with all databases. So if you have a good grasp on SQL, great. If you don't, you're going to get one in this class. Um, I've been told that you know, a lot of students they actually know about Oracle. They got all this Oracle experience, but they don't know anything about SQL. They don't know anything about DD DDL commands, DML commands. And all that. So I'm going to focus primarily on a lot of database concepts and then also show you, you know, the newest features of Oracle, just so you are familiar with that. But I'm going to assume you have no database concept background and kind of fill that in. And as we go through the course, if you decide or if you kind of think about it and go, well, you know what, I really need to know about this. I want to know about database backups. I want to know more about reporting features. I want to know about, you know, this and that. Because, you know, if you think about it, we have 15 weeks or studying Oracle. You could probably study Oracle for two years, or three years. I don't know. Actually, there's people who have been working with Oracle for years. Still don't know anything, everything about it. So I have to kind of mix and match and pick the things I think are, I think personally are the most important. However, it may not necessarily be what you think is the most important feature about Oracle. So that's why I put this email address down here just to remind you. That you can send me email messages and say, hey, are you going to cover JDBC in this course? Are you going to cover you know, Crystal Reports? Actually, I am both of those two. But are you going to cover something else? And then I can say, mm, okay, I can do that. No problem, I'll fit it in. And you know, usually if one person says it, everybody else is thinking the same thing. So hopefully that will work out for us. If it's something off the wall, it's not everything. Not everything's going to work. So if it's something totally out of you know, I'm not going to do certification track stuff, which is a bunch of memorization, and I'm not going to. It's not a certification course, as I mentioned in the beginning. All right, so let's talk about SQL and the command types. And this actually kind of sounds pretty fancy, but it's really simple. In fact, you don't even have to know this, what a DDL or DML is, because it's basically just two blanket categories of commands. So we have data definition languages, and we have data manipulation language, which is what the words stand for. And you'll hear it more along the lines of from admins, database administrators, and from people who use the language. And they'll go, well, you know, it's just basically taking a big clump of commands and breaking it out into different categories. So this is really just a lot of terminology. So anything DDL related is going to basically tell you how to modify, how to create a, create a table, create an object, set a privilege on a user, um, revoke privileges, grant privileges, and stuff like that. And I'll talk about that in a lot more detail. And then the manipulation language is going to have you insert data, delete tables, or delete data, view databases, and stuff like that. So it's just two categories. I'm going to go over both of these two. In fact, we have two weeks where we're just going to hit SQL nonstop back to back, which most people find probably the most valuable part of this course. I'm also going to put together videos that are going to show you this thing called an SQL plus window that I'm actually not going to show you until next week. But if you go online and look at those videos, you'll see it actually. Everything that we're going to do in this course is going to be done through that window. So there is no application to learn. <laughs> Long story short, there's no front end, there's no client. You install Oracle, you get Oracle. It just sits there on a server, and then you connect to it. So how you're connecting to it, you know, it depends. So if you take a class in JavaScript, or you take a you know development or <coughs> uh, website development, or if you take a class in Visual Basic or Visual Studio, or .NET platform stuff like that, or Java, you know, all have different ways of connecting to it. Um, in fact, once you figure out how to connect to it, that's half the battle. Once you connect to it, then you got to figure out what to do with it. So this class is more along the lines of what to do with it. 
everything that we're going to do is going to be in an SQL plus window. And this SQL plus window is a black window <laughs> with a flashing cursor. Looks like a DOS prompt, actually. You know, like before Windows came around. So it's like a Linux prompt window. In fact, if you were looking at a, if you were taking this course at a traditional university with a Sun system, that's what you'd get is a terminal window with a flashing cursor. So that's what we're going to get. Um, that's actually, that's what you get when you install the Express version, too. And so we're going to take that window and we're going to use it. And you're probably wondering, well, what can you do? You know, you direct. Well, the thing is, you can do everything. You can do your entire database administration through that window. And if you're a proficient DBA, you can do it from anywhere in the world. So if this Oracle is installed in a server in Colorado, you can connect through it through a terminal prompt. And you get this window. And then you back it up. You type commands, usually SQL commands. And you essentially run scripts, search, run queries, uh, and run all sorts of different functionality from that particular window. And that is your interface to the database. Um, so uh, long story short, if you're functional with that window, you can learn any application or any third-party tool that also kind of does the same functionality as that window, but adds a GUI to it in most cases. So. A lot of students are afraid because there's no GUI. So you just have to break that. If you're a Unix person, you'll love this course because it's all done in a, looks like a Unix prompt, actually. So it works out great. OK, going back to the DDL commands and summary that's used to create, modify the structure of the database. So when you log into this little terminal window, you create tables, you drop tables, you purge data, you update the data. You de basically define and manipulate the structure of the table, structure of the data through these, S these series of SQL commands. And you're probably wondering at this point, well, no, that's a lot of typing. I remember DOS. We had to type a bunch of things. We had to memorize a bunch of commands. We had to run things. Well, I'm going to show you how to automate it a little bit using files. So you basically create a file that has your entire database structure in it. You save the file. You go into the window, you load the file, you run the file. It's kind of like running a program at that point. So this enables you, if there's a problem, there's a virus on the server, the database goes down, within about five minutes you can recreate that database instantly. Which is, as a DBA, it's probably not, not a bad thing to be able to do. Because then you can actually repair the system, back the system up. Do we have a problem? Oh, is the audio not working? I have it recorded here, actually. <laughs> All right, so that's another good reason why I'm recording this video lecture. <laughs> All right, back to the lecture. Um, so the DDL commands essentially is going to be our power in terms of our database administration. Hardly any users of databases actually run into a situation in which they have to uh, use any SQL at all. So most of the tools that we're going to be learning are going to be geared towards administrators or database people who are working hands-on. So we're going to ex execute anything that's issued. And what ends up happening is we have a series of these commands. And um, if you could uh, please keep, keep the volume down in the back, because it's really hard for me to have everybody hear me with background noise. Hello. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, so the DML commands are the series of commands that are going to manipulate. Okay, so DDL, DML, and the difference is the D or the M. So define or manipulate, essentially. And these are the insert, the view, the modify. Um, and I'm not going to go through each one of these commands, but the concept is you're in, well, I am, no, but not right now. Um, you go into the SQL plus window, you start typing these commands, and then we have things and concepts that we have to deal with in terms of rollback and commit. Because what ends up happening, in fact, we all remember from the old DOS days, you know, delete star dot star. And we'll say, oh, everything's gone. Um, we have an entire management of the particular command. So we can load files in, save files, create files. We can commit things. And to commit something actually might be explained in the next one. No, nope, it's not. It's just down here on the bottom. To commit is to save, to roll back, is to revert back, to undo, to undelete changes and things. And those are actually part of the SQL language itself. So what we have, and I keep talking about this SQL plus window, is we have SQL. So this command in window. And the only way is to see it. So, I mean, and I'll, I'll actually have it up next week here, I think. But the only way to really kind of get a feel for it is to start using it, is my point. But anyway, 
So in this window, we type in commands, we perform functionality, and then we decide what we're going to do with it. Are we going to commit it? Are we going to roll it back? Because sometimes there might be a mistake. And then we have this thing called transaction management to also consider, which we'll spend about a week, week and a half on later on in the course. And because in terms of what actually encompasses a transaction, um, because if you think about real database applications out in the real world, such as a banking um, database, Transaction management is extremely important as a concept because we might withdraw from one account and then deposit into another account, but it, right in between the power goes out. And, or we lose the connectivity and our network goes down. Or we have a corrupted file or something happens. So we have part of the transaction done, but the other part is still waiting. And if you lose the power, everybody knows nothing happens. So what ends up happening is you have a partially completed transaction instead of a full transaction. So part of the design of applications, the design of using a database and interfacing with it, is being aware of and actually designing your tools, your, your queries and everything so that you have start and stop points and you've been able to track transactions actually called save points and stuff of that nature. So we'll talk about that as we go through. We start looking at how to actually run these commands in the real world. Okay, so as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this lecture, I said the word client server. So if we have a client, we have, ser we have one server out there, we have many clients. Part of the features that we'll be looking at in terms of Oracle is how to manage the user accounts because we have user schemes that we come up with with security. Because one of the issues of a client-server environment, we can let anybody we want connect to this database. If we have a student registration database, that'd be nice if students could just connect to it and enroll themselves. Actually, I think we're working on an application to do that, but I think there's a little bit more rules associated with it. Uh, or to change grade or do something like that. Instead, we have different profiles. So students can connect to, let's say, view transcripts, something of that nature, or view view academic records of their own, but they can't view somebody else's. Or people can connect to the database to do things that are related to their particular uh, rights or responsibilities that are associated with their account. So Oracle actually has a fairly sophisticated accounting system for users to manage access, to set up profiles. And that, believe it or not, can all be done via the SQL commands in that little black SQL plus window. So in terms of the scheme, we have the area of the database where the user database objects are stored. We actually have things like table spaces and segments and all sorts of different other configurations that we can do to configure the objects, to figure what space, what part of the database, what we've loaded, what we've unloaded. Because we can actually take this database, take part of it down, bring part of it back up, replace part of it modify part of it, and as the Oracle, it's still all together, still all running simultaneously. Um, you know, back it up, keep it, you know, keep it managed essentially. So we'll look at those features as well. In terms of identifying also um, unique usernames, password schemes, and that stuff as well, we'll take a look at that. And then each user scheme that's granted specific privileges. And then groups of privileges, um, and actually adding users to groups and things. So in terms of uh, the scheme of the way Oracle is organized, we have two categories of privileges, the system and the object. As I mentioned already, when you install the Express version, you'll have a main object created. It'll be called like ORA1 or something. It'll be some generic name. We're going to go in and create more objects. So you can create an object and call it HR as an example. And in the HR object, the, there's an owner of that object and it's a user, and usually maybe it's the manager of the HR department or something, or maybe it's probably a DBA at this point. But long story short, all of the tables that are associated with HR can be in that particular object. And an object is nothing more than an ownership or a privilege that's associated with contents. So inside of the object, you could have views, tables, if you don't know about views yet, don't worry about it. All these different components that are part of the system. And so skipping down to the kind of the lower point on the slide, because I started with objects first. That's an interesting buzz. Um, basically, you can be granted on individual data. Privileges can be granted on individual database objects. They can actually be granted on users as well. And if you grant it to the object, that means you know, this whole object has read-only access or has write. You know, you can update it, but you can't read it, or vice versa. 
um, which basically controls the access. Um, so it controls operations that users can perform on their specific objects. You know, obviously if you spend a lot of time and you design a nice HR system, you don't want people messing with it. So you can only have certain people have certain privileges, let's say, to update, uh, to change the table structure, which is where that DML versus D DDL kind of thing comes into play. You can actually set certain commands that everyone can do and certain commands that nobody can do. Like nobody can run a truncate or nobody can run a delete or nobody can do all these kind of dangerous commands versus the safe commands that might exist. In terms of the system privileges, controls the operations that users can perform within the database. Can they grant privileges to themselves? Probably not. Only the admin or supervisor can grant those privileges. Um, it might also be something for connecting to databases, creating to tables and things of that nature. Um, in fact, we'll see it hands-on a little bit more in terms of granting, revoking, and setting up uh, profiles, groups of people. Because, um, you know, it's, if you think back at network, if any of you have done any network administration, <coughs> database administration, network, it's about the same thing. You're working with a network. In fact, the whole nature of Oracle in terms of the client-server environment is network organization. You got users, you got access rights, you got a little bit more than your average network. You're, you know, when you think about a little bit beyond what happens on a normal network, people log in and they have access to certain directories and things. And you can actually kind of customize and profile and map out their structure and stuff. We can actually do the same thing for databases. So there's a lot of similarity. And if you like network management, network administration, you know, like Oracle because it's, you know, you're just working with another network essentially. The only thing different is that Oracle runs on an existing network, so it's just part of the main scheme. And uh, in terms of the uh, Oracle naming standard, this uh, pertains to the objects, it has to adhere to a naming standard. In fact, the good thing about Oracle is most of the naming standard is consistent among all of the different features. So if you can't do something for a name of an object, well, you can't do it for a username either. You can't do it for that. So, And uh, I'm not going to, because it makes no sense, actually, uh, for me to like read you off all of the different, you know, 16,000, you know, specs. That's something you memorize for a certification exam. Uh, instead, you know, it's helpful to know, you know, basically 30 characters long is pretty much all you've got. The interesting thing is, believe it or not, there's ways of actually configuring the system to avoid these rules. <laughs> because what ends up happening as you go through time, especially if you've been working at a company, Company's been around for years. They decide, well, let's switch to Oracle. Oh, you know, they're owned by you know, you know, they own Sun now. They're pretty big. We're gonna have some future with them. You have an old database. You're gonna try and convert it to the new one. Well, there's kind of different ways of kind of configuring it to kind of violate some of the rules and kind of tweak it a little bit to make the old database work with the new one. Um, so there's, there actually is for database application. There's a lot of flexibility. Some things are pretty st stuck in stone. Um, in terms of some of the haves, I mean, you can't use like reverse, like reserved words for database objects and things. You know, some of the stuff you can't break, but some of the other stuff you can modify. So, all right, so let me give you an example. Actually, this slide is good for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it shows you the SQL Plus window I've been talking about so far. And uh, well, normally it would be a black background, but you probably wouldn't be able to see it from where you were sitting. And uh, actually, let me move aside a little bit. Well, I'll move this way because most of you are sitting that way. So, well, no, now I'm in front of the video. Okay, let me move this way a little bit. I don't know if you can see it, but on the bottom of that screen, we've got Oracle SQL Plus. Looks like a DOS prompt window. We have SQL, a little cursor going there. This is what we're going to use. This is our main primary interface for the entire course. You're taking a course for a DOS window. It's not really, you keep calling it a DOS window, but it really isn't. It's an interface to, it's a terminal prompt window that interfaces directly to the Oracle that's sitting out there. All right, so here's a demonstration of a DDL command. Next week, we're going to start with SQL Bootcamp. Everything you ever wanted to know about the SQL language is going to last for about two or three weeks, actually. Uh, so it's pretty intense, uh, but it is seriously everything in the world. You also notice on top here it says Oracle SQL, and there's, S, there's like a little asterisk, and it says plus. Well, the plus is everything that's not standard. That's my, my definition of plus. Um, it's, uh, there's a couple of things like the word describe. If you watch the video number three of the Oracle series, the last one, 
I, we bring up the window, we, we type and we create a table, and then I use some plus commands. Plus is not standard SQL. I'll save that and kind of mix it in. There's not that much plus involved. Um, this, but bottom line is essentially the plus allows you to do Oracle specific commands, Oracle specific procedures, and then as that example I brought up, describe is not part of SQL, you know, describe space a table name. You know, that doesn't exist. Instead, what that does is it basically it's going to tell you what's in that table. You know, what are the columns? What kind of information is in there? There's a there's like you know half a dozen, eh, maybe about two dozen, I should say, more plus commands that we'll go through that'll actually show you how to actually be functional in that particular window. And uh, believe it or not, it might look like a simple interface, but it's pretty powerful. You can take down the entire database from this one window if you have the right command, actually. So. Um, so in this particular one done by DBA, we have a command that says create username, you know, identified by a password. So this is an example of the power of actually creating a user and giving it a password all in one sentence. Don't worry about the syntax at this point. <coughs> Excuse me, if you can't read the slide, not an issue. This is part of our SQL boot camp that's going to start next week. So You'll have more than enough opportunities to learn the create command. Actually, we'll see it in a lot of different ways. So I mentioned that uh, we have this privilege system that's part of the user accounting system. And this particular system um, has a pretty much a set of built-in levels. And so if you see in the middle column of the slide, the chart says level. It says user, 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 DBA. You um, will definitely uh, see this when you start manipulating database objects and start working with things because everything's owned by somebody. And when you log in, your entire environment is set for you. Your user account has privileges associated with it. And we're going to do something a little bit non-standard. When you log in, you're going to use system. Uh, when you install Oracle Express, you're going to be, uh, and this is my one caveat for anyone who's installing Oracle Express, Remember the password that you provide at the login and use something that you're going to remember. When you install it, it's going to ask you for a password. Remember that password. If you forget the password, you have to reinstall the whole thing over again. You have to start over. There's no way to recover it. It's not stored in a file. There's no way of getting it, um, which is actually a good safety feature. But it's bad for you, especially if you did this like in the middle of the night. You know, what was that password? <laughs> And for those of you who want to bump ahead a little bit, the admin, it's not called admin, it's called system. So your admin by default is system, S-Y-S-T-E-M, and your password is that one you have to remember from the install. So if you have that, then uh, what ends up happening is that um, you log in and it gives you full power to everything. So you don't actually, in the beginning, have to worry about user level DBA level or anything of that nature. And then what ends up happening is we'll create a user account that won't be system, that will be something lower. And we can, block off, we can block off sections of the database in which uh, you don't want to give public access to. We can create different sections and different database objects, assign different ownership. And just because something is owned by a different user, it's in a different object, it doesn't mean everybody can be assigned to have, actually have privileges to it. So. You know, people can select which database, which object to share with other users of the system. So we'll go through that. I'm not going to spend too much time going through all these different privileges. We're going to see it when we do the hands-on SQL boot camp starting next week. Uh, this is just an example of how it would be done in the SQL window. We use a simple grant command. Grant this privilege, that privilege to this user. And voila, you've now created a user, given it a password, and granted privileges to it. Um, which is why... Uh, a DBA can actually use that little terminal window from anywhere in the world, log in a database and grant a user, take away a user. You can do some pretty powerful things in just a few different commands, essentially, through that window. All right, so we have database roles as well to uh, talk about. The role um, is the database object that can be assigned system privileges. We have roles, you can think of as profiles. So roles, I talked about the one main one already. The default role that gets installed is the admin role. We have HR people, we have administrative assistants, we have engineering people. If this is, was a university database, we'd have students, teachers, faculty, all sorts of different roles. Uh, so you can actually create roles as well. 
using SQL. And uh, the roles assigned to a user. So you can take one user, sign them to this role, sign them to that role. And it basically, it's a kind of a streamlined method to actually come up with a list of privileges. You know, you say, well, the role of the student, they can do this, but they can't do that. You know, and basically it's a way, it goes back to the network programming kind of concept. Or if you set up profiles or roles, you know, groups of people assign them a role. There you go. What ends up happening, and you'll discover this, is just like network programming or network configuration, you get roles that conflict. You know, like, oh, you're given access to here, but you're not given access over here, and you're a member of both. So there's some kind of funky little configuration issues that people run into where, okay, the user logs in, but they don't have access to anything, you know, because they're a member of five different roles. Or, so there's some restrictions on the roles that basically are in place to... Uh, Ensure the integrity of the, of the system, essentially. And we'll go through that a little bit more in detail as well. You have to easily assign groups, basically. So if you, don't, if you don't get too carried away with the roles, they actually work well. Um, you, know, you can easily create a role, easily assign people to it. And here's our little SQL command. This is create role, role name. So we create a bunch of roles. We assign a bunch of privileges to the roles. And then we assign a bunch of users to the roles. And then we can do all that in one file. Or one, one, one little script, I call it. And uh, to assign a privilege to a role, we would just use a grant table, you know, grant create table to Oracle student as a privilege, as, as a student as a role. And then you get a little feedback. And there's actually another side note to kind of look at. You get grant successful. Grant successful. I mean, role created. You get nothing, actually. And wait until you get an error message. They'll say, error. Well, actually, this is a little bit more than just error. It says error, aura, or a 195273, I don't know, some long 11-digit number. Or, well, this is the old days. I think this is changing, and I haven't gotten too many errors. But actually, I did, actually. I got an error. I messed up my SQL command in one of my videos. And you see the error message that comes up. A lot more informative. So since Oracle took, well, since Oracle took Sun over, actually, so they've actually improved Actually, they've had a lot more development work um, because the major complaint about Oracle is you have published manuals with ORA errors, DB errors, all these groups of error messages. So it's so cryptic that it's really hard to tell what's going on. You have to look those errors up. Now I'm noticing actually in the 11G version, there's a little bit more like left out from. or <laughs> You actually have some meaning associated and no more numbers, which is actually a step in the right direction, I think. Um, but don't expect uh, too much, too much error checking and too much feedback from this window. Um, it's pretty much meant to be kind of a streamlined interface. Uh, so we looked at uh, granting. We can also revoke. So here's a revoke privilege one, privilege two from user. So you say, well, so and so got fired, and he's going through and he's posting nasty messages on the corporate website about so and so and so and so. Oh, no problem. Two seconds. Oof, you're done. Oh, he's logged off. He's, he's done. So an admin can kind of say, you know, and the admin's in California, the database is in Colorado or something. So and within two seconds, bam, you're done. No more. Uh, which is kind of tricky, uh, which is why we don't give system privileges to everybody. Could you imagine what would go on? People would just revoke everything, delete everything. Uh, which is why we have tools that we'll be talking about, like backing up, recovering, restoring. <laughs> You know, what happens if someone gets in there and starts granting this privilege to everybody or something of that nature. So the, the language is pretty powerful. You can also administer system privileges through the SQL interface. Here's a grant create table to L. Howard with admin options, uh, which means not only can they create the table, they can delete the table, truncate the table, add, add columns or something to the table. So to be able to grant a system privileges to other users, to a user account, can be granted with the uh, with uh, admin option. Because here's one thing that's interesting about the admin or AKA system account. System has access to everything. Because as a database administrator, you need access to everything. So you have all of the user account objects. You have access to essentially be everybody in the system. So it's kind of dangerous. In fact, uh, I actually, one time and only one time did I ever run into an application that was using system. And, you know, because here's what ends up happening. You create what's called a web login. Or, you know, you, you have this user that you create for your applications. 
is what ends up happening with Oracle is you build applications, front ends, clients, because your customers aren't going to use this. <laughs> I mean, if you gave them a little terminal window, they'd probably give it back to you. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with this window. Because people don't like that. You know, they like GUIs. They like buttons and things and scroll bars. And everything's on the internet these days. Anyway, so it has to be web-enabled front ends. So generally, you develop an application like a website, as an example, that has a shopping cart that's pulling out of an inventory that's on a database that's in Colorado or something. I keep saying Colorado. It could be California. It could be anywhere you want in the world. All databases don't come from Colorado. <laughs> so, all right, so you have this web login, and hopefully web, the web access to that database isn't system privileges. You know, it's something that's minimal. They can't delete, the web count can't delete anything. It can't truncate any, it doesn't have access to anything. All it has access to are those tables that belong to that application, to that particular part. And that makes your database more secure, actually. Because you use that one, and you use that one on every one of your applications. So every time that application logs in, because it does, it logs into the database, it runs the same queries as any other client that would log in. And actually, that application acts like a client. And as long as you've got the privileges set correctly, it doesn't really matter what happens on the internet, who hacks into what, you haven't given away system privileges to that database. And this is kind of the same thing you hear in your first or second lecture of Unix operating systems or something, you hear, don't log in, don't give out the admin password, don't make every user the admin. The same concept kind of applies. It's kind of dangerous. This is your control over the system, and you're going to mess it up if you give it out to your users. But lo and behold, there are still some places I go to, and I'm like, wow, you've got admin privileges, and you're the secretary. <laughs> How did that happen? You know, it's because the admin didn't know any better. Um, all right, so defining uh, database tables. So let's talk about the table. And I know this is the first database lecture, so we have to start with some rudimentary concepts related to the relational database design. Everything in the, the Oracle system is not a table. A table is just one component. We have things like views. We have things like accounts. We have a bunch of other things. But when we talk about relational concepts and relational schemes, it all starts with the table. And the table is a basic structure. You actually have to specify a few requirements. And hopefully, if you're designing the database correctly, you're specifying all of these and not just getting away with the bare minimum. Because what ends up happening is people love to create tables. And they love to put everything but the kitchen sink into that table. And then they forget about constraints and requirements. In fact, I've seen databases where every field was a text field, variable character of 200 characters in length. Even though it was like a gender column where it has one character, M or F or something, you know. So you could get carried away, you could be generic with it, but if you actually design it correctly, what ends up happening is you get functional tables that don't take up too much memory, that actually work well, that are self-preserving. And this is where the concept of the constraints, the last item on the slide, is all about. So we can all pretty much figure out what a table name is. You can't, you might be taking the wrong class, I don't know. But you got to name the table. And the table, you know, you'll get into that. There's different, there's different schemes for table names. But, you know, we're going to call it employees as an example. And then you're going to have field names that are hopefully going to be self-explanatory, like first name, <coughs> last name, date of birth. And hopefully you're going to be smart enough to create a date of birth and not age column. Because the concept is you want to store data and run calculations on the data to come up with the information. So if you put an age every year, you've got to update the age. So if you put a date of birth, you can actually calculate age from that. Same thing with start date instead of years of service. But you cite, no, actually, I don't really see that one anymore. But I used to see, you know, number of years, you know, num number of units makes sense. Except for that's not good either. <laughs> but anyway, long story short, uh, We've got field names that are populated by inserts that happen from data that we collect from all different types of sources. So it's actually not a bad idea to come out with good field data types. If it's a number, make the data field a number. And we, in Oracle, in fact, we'll see more of this next week when we start creating the SQL queries to create these tables. You'll see I have a couple of different options when it comes to numbers, a couple of different options when it comes to text fields and all the different types of databases, database types. 
and there's a field size that we can actually specify. You know, do we want it one character, 12 characters, 20 characters? And bigger is not always better. What happens with bigger is like every time a row is created, space is reserved for each one of these fields. So if you say, what is the maximum? 2,000. Okay, everything's 2,000. You end up with a database that's huge, that only has like maybe itsy bitsy little pieces of information in it, but we've reserved the space. We've allocated it for every one of our rows. So it's kind of a design methodology that says, well, you want to have more room for other stuff. So we pick data types out specifically so that we can't enter in characters where numbers belong. We don't have too many spaces allocated, waste space and stuff like that. Because once you create it, you can modify it, but then it becomes a hassle at that point. The theory is you want to create the table once and then update it as much as you want, query it as much as you want, but leave it alone. Because if you're not, um, if you're not careful with what you're updating, you end up with bad integrity among and bad inconsistency among the table. Like half the rows have a first name and a last name, but all, you know, other half of the rows only have, uh, you know, last name or only have middle name or something. And they don't have everything that's associated with what needs to belong there. Field sizes, constraints. Constraints might be, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, is it a primary key? Is it a unique key? Is it, um, you know, it, what, what kind of control are we going to put on that field? An interesting thing is the more constraints we put on the database, the better the database is. Because we did build the database once, it lasts forever. We have one database, we have millions of applications that connect to it, millions of clients. Isn't it nice just to do it once right? <laughs> if you do it right in one place, then you don't have to fix it everywhere else in all those millions of applications. So it's, it's not a bad idea to pay attention to some good database design techniques. So uh, the table names in the fields must follow the naming convention. I already mentioned one to 30 characters. I know there's some other, there's other, some other restrictions as well. Each table is a user, and a user scheme must have a unique name. This is interesting. What's very common, because we're working with an object system, is we have an HR object as an example. We might have a customer table, a sales table, all these different tables. But you can have another object that's called something else with the same set of tables in them. So we can actually have a backup. We can have it swap them. You know, at a couple of commands actually, well, one command actually swaps them um, into a different view or something. Um, so we can have many different objects, many different tables. But obviously, you know, common logic would tell you that you have to have unique names, just like files for any user. Same thing happens in Unix. You know, you have many different users. They all could have the same file names, but one user can't have uh, you know, multiple file names of the same. The system can't keep track of it. Each field and table must have a unique name within that particular table as well. A little requirement. When we talk about Oracle data types, kind of like the same data types we see in any other database, we actually have some interesting ones here. Um, we have your generic, your dates. In fact, I think there's like four different variations of the date. And I can put the year first, the month, let's say. And the interesting thing is, is if you develop a table, you define a table and you give it a certain format, it wants that format. Common source of error messages, common source of problems is when you put it in a different format. And you try, or you take text and you put it in and it's not a date. Because what ends up happening with Oracle is it's kind of self-preserving. If you, if you say it's supposed to be text, you have to give it text. Otherwise, we're not going to take it. It's going to spit it out. And if it doesn't like one column in the entire row, it spits out the entire row, which is great. So once you figure out oh, it's not good, I guess it's not good if you can't get the data in. <laughs> but if you get it, at least you know all the rows are going to have all of the required fields in them, and they're all going to have the right data type and stuff like that. So what ends up happening is we build a very strong, strict database. We put the constraints on the database table, and then we let the web people do the air checking. <laughs> so, because what ends up happening is if we have a really strict database, then every time they try to send it a bad row, it's going to reject it, it's going to come back to the application, uh-uh, not taking you. And then, so it basically makes the web people do a lot more work. So we have form error checking control so that we have every of the required fields are filled in and all the stuff's done out here. Which means when it finally gets to the database, it's actually good. It's something that we can use. 
And in terms of uses, we can use the data types for, as I just described, error checking. We can also use it for the efficient use of storage space, which means if we actually are using the correct data types, we can manage our storage space better um, in terms of our database utility. And I'm just going to kind of, in fact, I can actually go through all of these different data types, and this is basically your uh, introduction to SQL as well, because these, these are the data types that we specify in the SQL statements that we'll be creating. And uh, we have, a, you know, it's not plain English. It should just be text or something, right? Like, I think Microsoft Access has data types called text or string or something. Here we have this thing called character variable. Well, variable character. I don't know. I like to say var care. I don't know. Where did the two came from? It's the second generation. It used to be one that said var care without the two. I guess this supports a larger ASCII character set. I don't know. Um, anyway, what we got is a variable length. This is our string. This is our text. It's going to look like this in all the text. In fact, here's the main problem. Students say, you know, oh, you know, I don't understand. Why does it say that? Why is it variable character? What is that? You know, what, why is this date with all of these different parameters and I can't get the input in correctly? Because you actually have to, like, and I use the word typecast, but it really is a typecast or a conversion of your data. Because everything that you're going to get is going to be in text. Even your numbers are going to be in a text format. If they're coming from a web page, does HTML send out anything else other than text? No. So most of your applications, you're going to have to convert that data. So it's best to get familiar with and get comfortable with the data types so that in Visual Basic, C++, .NET, Java, you can actually convert to a variable character. <laughs> you can actually convert to what you need and actually get the length that you need and truncate around or do stuff um, to, to abide by it. Uh, the two gets up to a maximum of 4,000 characters, so you can actually specify how many characters you want to save this particular variable. You must specify the maximum width allowed. Um, I don't think the first one, variable character without the two, I don't think you actually had to specify the length, uh, but now you actually have to do no trailing blank spaces are added at the end to fill in to 2,000 or 4,000 or however long you have it. It just basically takes in what you give it. Here's an example on the bottom. If you said student name space variable character 30, the 30 says you're going to create a string or character length string and it's going to have 30 characters in it. So if 31 characters came through, it's going to only put 30 in the database. So it's probably logical. And then we have character. So we don't have to worry about the length. It's the fixed length character data. And it not, not to be confusing, however, most people would just use character or they would use variable character. In fact, a lot of people you'll see just use variable character because they're pretty much the same thing. That one allows you to store more than that one. That one, if you have one or two. So if you're going to go M or F on a field, you're going to say gender, M or F, or I don't know, none of the above, <laughs> you would have, um, you probably wouldn't want to put 30 characters on, you probably only put one. So here we have student underscore gender character one. So if we get more than one, it's going to spit out an error. It's going to say, wait a minute. This is the wrong data for this particular column that you're trying to populate. We're not going to accept it. This is the maximum allowable information that you're going to put in here. And then we have n character. Well, that's not a character. <laughs> it supports 16-digit binary character codes used for alternate alphabets. So actually, believe it or not, this is not even an extensive list. I only gave you three different character formats. We actually have a lot more that are not as common that people use for international characters to support uh, tildes, accent marks, and things of that nature. And uh, if you're working with an international application, what ends up happening is you get the reference books and you go, what kind of character set should I use? Because then if the user enters in something that has a tilde or an accent or something of that nature, or something that's not normally occurring in, let's say, standard English, then the database is going to reject it, or it's not going to capture it. If you want the database to, then you have to use the right character set, essentially. Um, so you can actually configure the system to use different, different character sets for it. Number is well, that's pretty normal. It's a number, so number is a number. You don't have to say float, integer, double, anything like that. It's just a number. Uh, so in a lot of ways, this is easier than programming. Uh, you can actually specify out the precision and the scale as well. Don't really be concerned about the syntax at this point when we start our SQL boot camp. We'll go through all of this stuff. But uh, this is basically the information on the data types that I'm not, probably not going to go into that much detail with um, next week. 
So the number data type is an integer, a fixed point, a floating point specified by the precision and the scale. So we say we, it's a number, and then we say, well, how many decimal points do we want on this number? How big do we want the number? How much kind of precision do we want? I'm thinking that a number is a number. So the precision is the total number of digits. The scale is the number of digits to the right of the decimal point. It's going to be one place out, two places out. For money, you know, two places out. We can actually come up with schemes for um, uh, rounding, things of that nature. There's some rounding rules that are built in. And you're wondering, well, why do we care? Actually, believe it or not, people who write financial applications that run in databases really care about this stuff. <laughs> Could you imagine what would happen if you messed up a social security number or an account balance? If it was 1 million 999,000 and you want to make that 2 million? You just gave them, you know, <laughs> just gave them a lot of money. Um, or do you want to take money away from them? Uh, so precision, which is one of the good features of Oracle, it's used a lot for financial databases. In fact, there's Oracle Financials, there's Oracle this, there's Oracle this. Specialized applications that work with it that help generate applications. So the language, um, I shouldn't say the language, the data type selection is quite extensive and it can be added to actually. It can be complemented with special <coughs> stuff that's needed for particular applications. It can be customized is what I'm saying. So, in terms of the integer numbers, whole numbers with no digits to the right of the decimal place can be used. Precision is the maximum width. Scale is omitted in here. So in terms of an integer, we have two age, because you can't have a half, well, unless you're five and a half or something, we'll just call you six or something, or five, so. All right, fixed point numbers uh, contains a specific amount of decimal places. Precision is the maximum width, and here we have uh, a sample declaration of an item price, which is a number, five decimal place, five with two decimal places, because it's a price, it's a dollar amount, so. It would be nice if we actually could call this, let's say, a double or something, but we can't. And we actually have to use what's built in, in the format that's built in. Floating point precision, we have GPA number. So S underscore GPA number. And hopefully, if you've been looking at the, the way the samples have been working, we always see the name of the field, space, the type of data. That's going to be the syntax that you're going to see, the data type after the field name. In almost every query that you run, those things go hand in hand. And they only basically affect the table creation. Once you create it with that type, you don't have to specify type after that over and over again. And as I mentioned before, with the date type, we have a lot of different variations because Oracle is kind of an international kind of application used in a lot of different ways, different countries and things. So some people don't always like their dates in the same format. So in here we have a date that's being stored, 1-1, one, one, well, 47, 1-2 BC. To 1231 AD stores both the date and the time component, which is interesting because you'd think you'd actually have to say time. But if you get the date, you get the time too. You get them both all into one, which is kind of a new concept for new people. In terms of the default date, it goes day, month, year, as we normally see, hours, seconds, minutes. So here's what ends up happening you build this nice application and you say, date, well, give me the date. And you get the date and the time. And you wonder, well, why is that printing on the screen? So then you have to, oh, let me go back and change my query so that I'm only getting the time, or I'm only getting the date, or I'm only getting the hours and the minutes, but not the seconds. Because what ends up happening is, although this seems kind of like a trivial thing at this point to you right now, it's a source of problems. <laughs> when you actually build your own database, and you're working with the table, that's great. And you can do anything you want. And then you see the effects of it when you start building an application that works with the table, you start printing stuff to the screen, and you say, why in the world do I have this space that's this big for an M or an F that's coming through that's not fitting right in my form or it's not working right? And then you go back and say, well, let's change the database to make this smaller. You know, let's say one character instead of 20, or change the date format, or change something so that we don't have to keep struggling with this. Because you can fix almost everything with an SQL query. So once you create a bad, and this is not recommended, Create, you know, flip a coin, create a table structure. <laughs> As I say, flip a coin method is meaning you didn't apply any methodology at all. You just flipped a coin, decided I'm going to have this table, I'm going to have that table, I'm going to put this in here. Everything's going to be text, and everything's going to be 200, 200 field lengths. And believe it or not, people do this. It's not, this is not a joke. Actually, people do this. And then everyone, oh yeah, I've got the database for you. Here it is. 
Okay, great. And then every application you you can almost fix all of that stuff with SQL. And it works, actually. It's just how much work do you really want to put into it, essentially. So if you actually pick out the right date format, you can actually pull it out from the query and actually display it on the screen, put it in where it's supposed to be, assign it to whatever variable it needs to be assigned to without having to do a type conversion or, you know, get rid of this, get rid of leading characters and, you know, following characters and stuff. Anyway, going back to the day, here's a sample declaration. Just say state, uh, student underscore DOB date of birth date. We use a date format. Specifying date and time. If no time value is given, then a new date is inserted with the default time. And you obviously see those little, you know, when you lose the power. <laughs> you see, it always says 1200. I don't know where that came from, actually. On, in the United States, on any electronic device you ever like a VCR where you set the date or an oven, you know, this is flashes, you know, when you lose the power, it says 12 o'clock. I don't know who decided on that, actually, but it's a good idea. I would have probably done 0, 0, 0, but is that really a, is that really a time? I don't know. Anyway, so that's what you get, actually, in Oracle, which means one of these days you're going to be working with somebody's application and you go, what time did that person register? 12 o'clock. <laughs> oh, great. Perfect. You know, it's not really 12 o'clock, it's whenever, because nobody actually thought about inserting the correct time, they just left it blank or something. So you got, you, know, you got, oh, we, don't, we can't use that information, it's wrong. Or the system date is wrong and they're using the system date on the server. Or they're in California and they're connecting to that server in Colorado and it's three hours ahead or, I don't know, maybe two hours, I don't know the time difference in Colorado. And then the date on the server is being inserted as the current time and date. Although the person's in California, so then they go back to do a refund and you can actually, if you're a banking application and you, your database is running through an ATM machine, you don't want a customer to do a withdrawal a couple of different times <laughs> on the same $20 just because the date's messed up and the system still thinks it's there. Or do a deposit and then withdraw like right after each other and get more money than what was actually inserted or you know there's like there's little problems that date and time actually pose so Oracle has some pretty good features when it comes to flex, fle being flexible and how you do it so uh, if no date value is a given then the time is uh, inserted default date is the first day of the current month as well uh, which could or could not work against you all right, so here's where Oracle differs from a lot of other databases out there. Even, uh, well, MySQL, I think the current version of it is supporting large binary objects. Uh, but we have this new data type, it's called a large binary object, uh, LOB, or large object binary. Uh, hmm. Binary large object, BLOB, uh, whatever you want to call it, it stores up to four gigabytes of binary data. That's pretty big. What can it be? It can be a video. It can be a multimedia file. It can be a Microsoft Word file, a PowerPoint file. What does this mean? Well, it's actually not a traditional data type. It's what actually makes object orientation part of Oracle, even though Oracle is not an object-oriented database. It has object-oriented properties because you can store large binary objects. So think about an application such as iTunes as an example iTunes, what is it? We got content. It's a database. We got, I don't know if it's really written in Oracle. It's probably, I would hope it, well, I don't know if it is or not, but don't quote me on this. Um, as an example, however, it has uh, audio files, video files, books, ebooks, PDF files, up to four gigabytes. I don't think there's anything bigger than four gigabytes. You can easily create an Oracle database that would actually store all of this content. So you have one song, one video, one of everything. You got many clients connecting to the database, getting through to the point where they can download that item. So they sit there, they do a query. You can actually write a query to download an MP3 file or an MP4 file. And it gives you the ability to basically take the database concept and extend it out to an application. So now you have an iTunes database is an example where you have clients connecting to it, mobile clients from cell phones, from computers, from all over the place, going to this database, downloading content. It doesn't take up that much space if you think about it. There's only one copy of everything out there. It's all organized and you use a query language to connect to the database to see if you've got access to it 
oh yes, you've paid for it, okay, you have access to it, to keep track of users. So when you subscribe to iTunes, you have a user account, you log in, it knows what you've downloaded, it's kept track of all that stuff. Great database application, made possible with bi large binary objects because you can store files and store things. Well, you can do this in a company, too. You can have a content management system. Um, I don't know, actually, if the EMS does this or not, but you could actually create the database to store the lectures, to store the video files that we're making in the database field, not on a hard disk, not on, like, individual files. Why do you want to do that? Well, you've got the database that's managing everything, and you're controlling the access to the content, and you're providing your own consistency for it in your own organization. Everybody knows the old file structure doesn't work well. You know, hard disks die. <laughs> um, files get lost. They get mismanaged. They float all over the place. A database actually provides more consistency puts it all together, provides uniform access, security, all the other features, you know, backup capability. With that, you can, you know, especially with large binary objects, not to give you another sell point on it, but it uh, makes it easy. It makes it a lot easy to manage that type of an application. Can you imagine what they would be doing? And the iTunes people, you know, have file system after file system of all those files. It would be ridiculous. Because the other thing that you can do with Oracle is, um, you can create what's called, and I'm going to talk about this after I get done with our SQL boot camp that's going to start next week. When I start talking about Oracle features, you can create what's called a table space. So let's say you've got four hard drives in the system. And each one of those four hard drives has a gigabyte. Let's say it's an old system. They have this installed on. So you have four gigabytes of data. You can create a four gigabyte table space and have it span over those four hard drives. And it's kind of like an image. It's not actually physically recorded on the drive, but it's using the drives to actually physically, mechanically bring up and store temporarily the information while it's running. So one of the drives dies, you pull it out, you put a new one in. You take the database down before you do that, bring the database back up, and you essentially have a system in which you have more space that could physically fit on one drive individually. If you have Microsoft Access, you have a file. You take that file, you create a database, we have Microsoft Windows file limitations. For computer science people, you know, a file can't be 3 or 4 million gigabytes or whatever. It can only be 64,400 and something or other bytes. I don't remember what it was. Uh, and I'm sure it's changed over the years. But uh, in essence, what, you're what I'm ta saying is that you have a limitation. One of the good things about Oracle is that as an Oracle, you define the environment you set the space, you create the objects in the environment, it can grow. All you do is start adding more hard drives to it. It's the same Oracle, it's the same system, it just spans out a bigger area. If you've got one that can take large binary objects in it and you're storing it in there, and you find out your iTunes last year, you know, every year we have new artists that come out, you know, a new version of some, what's that guy, Beaver or something? I don't know. As he's getting older, he's going to make more music. <laughs> the young guy, Justin or whatever, who makes music. Yeah, he's like, what, 15 now, I think? I don't know. And he's going to get older. He's going to, it's like Michael Jackson in the beginning, who's young, you know. You know how many Michael Jackson songs are out there? Well, I'm sure we're going to have more Justin Bieber songs. But as he gets older, he's going to be making more songs, which means your database is going to grow. iTunes is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger with all his new songs in there. And one of the things about managing it is you just add more resources to it. You just give it another server. More, more hard drives, more space, more memory, and the thing just grows. Um, and if you configure it properly, you have an adequately running system. For your purposes of, of your express version, to tell you the truth, it's a memory hog. When you download Oracle Express and you run it, it's going to be like a gig, up to three gigs of memory. And you don't really need that, really. And it's going to take up your running RAM. It's going to make your system run slower. So you can shut the services off, you can install it when you need it, and uninstall it when you're done with this course, which is I recommend, unless you're going to run it on a server, and then that's a different story. And before I get, forget to mention it, the differences between the express version and the full version, in fact, I think they're getting away with the express. I think they're actually removing the express notation on it, because I noticed the 11G didn't say it, it just said standard on it. 
If you download it for free and you haven't bought any licenses, you have one user at a time that can simultaneously log on to it. Not very functional for a full database application, which means if you want to use that standard free version in a real application, it's not going to work for you. The other thing, too, is that the table spaces, and I'll talk about that later when I talk about memory and stuff like that, um, have limitations. Number of users have limitations. Tons of limitations. However, it's everything. You have all of the full features as if you paid you know, three or $4,000 for a 10-seat license or whatever it costs these days. Um, so you have full capabilities, which means it's great for teaching because you can actually go through and see all of the features, and we're going to be looking at most of them. So, All right, you guys are getting anxious already. It's not even that late. <laughs> it's not that late yet. I've only got, only got about half of the lecture left. Yeah, it's not too bad. Actually, I'll, talk, I'll start talking faster. How's that? All right. All right, so going back to large binary objects or large whatever. Anyway, so we have B file stores a reference to a binary file maintained in the operating system. So although you don't want to copy the file in, you don't want to, you don't, your database isn't really that big, you actually have a bunch of files stored. You can do, store a reference instead. Or a character large binary object stores 16 bit character code that's associated with it. And uh, declaring these, and again, going back to our examples on, you know, how if you were to use this data type for something, you'd say image, item image, and call it, give it this type. I'm at item image, give it that type, using an image as an example picture. So I'm sure that the, uh, like, uh, what is it, Netflix or, no, um, actually Netflix, I would assume, would use some sort of database like this, actually, now I think about it. But I was thinking about, like, Flickr, some of those online, you know, Shutterfly, stuff like that. I mean, you know, Upload images. Well, even um, even YouTube, when you upload images, I'm sure they're using some sort of a database structure to organize those files. So, all right, creating a database table. I've actually talked about everything but this so far in terms of the fields and the data types. We use actually a command called create table, and then the name of the table. And this kind of gives you a preview of what we'll be talking about in a lot more detail. With a few more examples next week. And uh, we have field name number one with a data type. Field name number two with a data type. And uh, essentially, this is how we're using it. The example below actually puts it together. So we have a create table, which is an SQL command. And we're going to call it my students in this example. And we're creating a student ID, a name, a date of birth, and a class. Um, and so this is how those data types fit into the picture. The data types are associated with the field names and allows us to essentially, you know, right there on the spot when we create the table, we've already defined the data types. And um, if this scares you, it's something you have to get used to because eventually, even if you use a GUI tool, because I have a lot of students that say, you know what, there's so many GUI, you know, like it's almost like people that use PHP admin all the time. You know, it's a web front end to MySQL, another popular database out there. There's actually a PHP admin that connects to Oracle as well. You get in there, you can, you know, drag stuff over, you can click and, you know, you can set properties and pick from a drop down menu. Only problem is, is unless you have the tool, you're stuck. If you're at a company, they don't use that tool, they use something else, you're stuck. Uh, if you don't, if you can't actually type basic SQL commands, you end up limiting yourself on what you're able to do in the long run. So it's not, not a bad idea to get familiar with the concept only because it'll help you further down the road. Even if you don't actually work with the database, it's actually not a bad idea to be able to read through scripts and see where a problem might be to troubleshoot something of that nature. So the constraints, we don't have any constraints in this. This is just a basic table creation where in which we've de designated some field types. We can add some constraints to it. Well, those are the rules, as I mentioned before, the rules that restrict the values that can be inserted. If we put the constraints on the table, make sure we actually get values that are inserted in the correct format, the correct type. The types of constraints can be integrity or value. We can actually tell the database we want an M or an F. We want a date. We want a string. So in terms of the uh, integrity, defining a primary and a foreign key, um, and I'll talk about that actually, uh, maybe not next week, probably the following week. Uh, but in terms of uh, you know, designating a field as a primary, designating it as a foreign, believe it or not, you can actually say that this field is a foreign key. If you're familiar with the concept or if you're curious, a primary key is a unique value that's in one table. 
And uh, it could be something like a social security number. It can be something like a you know, student ID. And if it's used in the student table, it's a foreign key out there in the registration table. Because we basically don't want to repeat all the student information. What we do is take that primary key, move it over to another table, and it's a foreign reference, essentially, because it doesn't actually belong in this table. It belongs in that table where it was a primary. So we can use the foreign key, and we can actually you know, access all of the information. We, that's how we link the tables together. And when I run through the entity relationship diagramming and how to actually use a methodology to design these tables, then we'll kind of see that make a lot more sense, because there's a scheme. There's a way that you're supposed to do this um, so that you can actually create a database design that minimizes the number of tables and maximizes the strengths and the constraints. Strength and the constraints. That sounds weird. And uh, actually kind of make the system work as a system instead of a kind of a flip a coin kind of method. All right, so types of uh, constraints, the value constraints, specifying out values. You can actually specify out a range of values. This helps you when you're kind of trying to figure out, well, what do we put for social security number? You know, can we allow all zeros in there? You know, probably not mm -hmm. a good idea. And this prevents people from, you know, filling out forms and cheating. You know, we've all probably tried to do that at one point. We don't want to give out our real information. Date of birth is 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 <laughs> or something of that nature. And uh, some database is actually taken in just fine. And then later on, someone's got to clean it up. So the better your constraints, the less cleanup people have to do further down the road. Um, constraint levels. So I've been talking about table level constraints at this point and columns. Um, so actually, I've been talking about column level. There's also table level constraints as well. In a column level, you're restricting the fields, let's say, to an M or an F or to something above zero for a number. Restricts the specific column. In terms of the table constraint, you're going to restrict the value of a field with respect to other values in the table. That example might be to use, let's say, a unique social security number or a unique last name or first name or something. So we don't have five Barbara Heckers in the table. <laughs> we only have one. Uh, why do we want that? Because, you know, what do we want to do with five entries? In fact, if you've ever called up to a customer service department and they say, what's the last four digits of your social security? Okay, what's your zip code, you know? And they're asking for all this information. It means they have multiple primary keys. They, have mul they don't have a real constraint on this. And you're probably in the system five times under different information, and they have to find one of you in there. So, yeah, actually, I probably have multiple accounts practically everywhere. I've signed up for stuff. Yeah, and as I've gone through the years, people have gotten smart about that and reduced it down a little bit. So now, I, you know, now they don't ask for the full Social Security number anymore, which is good. Uh, so anyway, an example might be a primary key value that must be unique from all other records. So it keeps it so you only have one of each person and one of each type. We have constraint names that we can put on this. So internal name used by the database management system to identify the constraints. And we actually have this thing called a trigger that we can do that would actually take and put a constraint if you wanted to. It can actually run a formula. So you have a telephone number. In fact, the best example of the trigger is the United States Postal Service. They'll verify your address before they'll print your label. So if you put in a wrong address, what ends up happening is they take the data that you've put in, and a trigger is just like a, an activity that occurs. It's an it's a, it's a algorithm that's being run. What they do is they take the address and they match it to the national database of addresses. And they say, is it good or is it bad? If it's bad, which means it doesn't exist, they flip it back and say, there's something wrong with this address. Because what they don't want is a return package. <laughs> so they put this in here, so your package is going to make it to a valid address in the U.S. or internationally. And I would say their international check isn't so good. I don't think they actually do that. They only do it on U.S. addresses, I think, at this point, but don't quote me on that either. Long story short, it's put in there to verify the information to make sure it's correct before it gets entered into that database and for an intricate process. And you can actually put that on your database. Oracle has that capability. So you can run it through and say, is this person really born this year? You know, or wait a minute, this person's under 18. You can't go and register on this site. Or to do all sorts of different checks on information to see, you know, is this a real person? Um, you know, kind of verify things. So each constraint name is a user scheme, must be unique. So you can have these predefined constraints. It might be birthday check, address check. 
And the constraint can either run a trigger or store procedure. A store procedure is kind of like a trigger, but it's, it's a SQL statement that's actually saved and rerun. So you don't have to keep sending it to the database. It's already there. It's like a function. It just runs over and over again. I'll talk about that a little later on, too. If you don't name a constraint, the system actually will automatically generate one for you and uh, put it in there for you. And here's some examples here, constraint naming conventions, where we have the table name, the field name, and the constraint ID. This is how the system is actually going to put it in there for you. So we have things like PK, FK, primary key, foreign key, stuff like that. An example might be a my students underscore S underscore ID underscore primary key. That means it's going to check to make sure that it's a primary key. It's going to run the constraint, kind of actually verify that the student's not already in the student table before it starts adding it into the student table. A lot of this stuff is actually done automatically for you if you've actually created the table correctly. So if you create the table correctly from the table level, your life is a lot easier. You don't have to make up for it everywhere else. In terms of the primary key constraints, on the top level, you define a primary key as a constraint. And we'll look at this next week. Actually, at the bottom in the example, you see where it says the words. And you actually write the word, the words. Oops, my mouse isn't working. Primary key on the bottom here. I was trying to hover over it with the mouse, but it's not working. So my mouse went to sleep, <laughs> like the rest of you out there. <laughs> now, actually, you're still awake, surprisingly. Wait till next week. It'll be like jogging in place, trying to keep up. Especially if you're new to SQL, so I don't know. And so that's uh, you guys are old, old SQL people. You can correct me. <laughs> so. All right, we're almost done, believe it or not. I keep promising that. All right, so primary key constraints can be defined when a field is declared. And here's a better example. And this is actually giving us not only an example of how to create a constraint, but also how to create a table in real SQL. All of these examples, actually, you can type in. Um, in fact, if you go through the lecture series that's on video um, on YouTube, you can actually, there's a couple of tables that we're going to create. We're going to build a database system, so you can actually kind of do it hands-on a little bit more. And here, uh, the constraint is at the end. I can't get my mouse to go in there. It says primary key at the end if you see it past my students underscore um, ID. So, all right, you can also define it uh, after all of the table fields have been defined. So you can see it on the bottom. It says constraints. So you can either mix it in to the SQL query or you can put it on the bottom. The reason why you want to do that sometimes is because then at this point you might want to change it in the future. So this is kind of integrated. Whoops, this one's kind of more integrated into the query. And we'll go through all of this stuff next week in a lot more detail. And uh, here's some more syntax um, in terms of the constraint must be defined after fields that can basically compose the key that are basically defined. So. I'm not going to spend too much time on the. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the syntax right now because we're going to see a lot more of it next week. Um, but anyway, kind of sum things up in terms of the uh, foreign key constraint. That's also another constraint. In fact, people don't really think about it. They just say, "Oh, it's a foreign key." You know, you can actually tell the table it's a foreign key. <laughs> the reason why we want primary keys and foreign keys is because we want to know what, from a table perspective, what we should be searching on. Because everybody knows you can search the table many different ways. You don't even have to know SQL to know that. Uh, and then sometimes you actually get different counts. How many students are attending I2? Well, this number. When we run a query a different way, we get this number. And we get it. And which number is correct? We don't know. So if we put the constraint on there, and then we know always search on this number, always search on this number, then we have a this is the foreign key, this is the primary key. We know exactly what we're supposed to do, so all of our numbers are consistent. And I'll tell you one thing, if you search the database multiple times and you get different numbers, there's probably something wrong with the database, actually. <laughs> there's it's more than just the application you're working with at that point. All right, so let me skip through a little bit faster here. Foreign key constraints. Um, actually, it's good timing. Um, value constraints can be put in as well at the column level to restrict. We want an M or an F. We don't want uh, any other character in there. Restricts the data values that can be inserted. You want to avoid value constraints because they make the database very inflexible, um, especially when there's something new. There's probably not going to be a new M or an F, but there might be a new color or there might be a new something that comes out. And so you've built this database, and as I've been saying all night, 
we want to put as much constraints in it, we want to tighten it down, make it as secure as possible, we can actually get too overboard on it and then make it very inflexible so that somebody comes up to us and says, well, how come we can't query this way? You know, or how come we, you know, now we have this new color, it's called magenta. You know, well, how come we can't put that in there? It won't take the value. And then all of a sudden, oh, okay, then you got to loosen up the control a little bit. So it's a pro and a con. Uh, we have different types of values as well, not null and null. Um, we'll talk about that because that actually plays a part in our search results because we can run a query and basically what we're looking at is not null specifies the field cannot be null, meaning we can't leave it empty. Because if you're searching on a query and you got find empty, you're not counting empties, or maybe you're counting empties, or maybe empties mean something in one instance, but they don't mean something in another, or vice versa. So those nulls can actually kind of wreak havoc on our queries. But I'll talk about that essentially later on. Uh, we can also put in default values. So what if the person doesn't put in a date? Well, let's put today's date in there. Um, so we can actually, by default, put a value in to basically, well, if the value says unknown or something, that means the person didn't give us that information or something. We can also say that something needs to be unique, meaning we have a roster, everybody's checking in, you can't all put the same student ID on it. <sighs> if you do that, I know I have, you know, I don't know, 60 or 100 or so people that are all the same. That doesn't do me any good. So. All right, so you've already seen the, uh, we don't have this window anymore, so I'm going to squip through it. We've already seen using SQL plus window. I've already talked about that, actually. All commands must be terminated with a semicolon in this window. I'm going to go through a lot more of the syntax next week when we start looking at SQL. And you have to use a text editor. Again, uh, actually, believe it or not, for this class, you can use Notepad for everything. In fact, I highly encourage you actually put things in Notepad. How about students like write stuff out on paper and then they type it into the window and then their database crashes or something, something happens. You get, if you put it into a text pad, notepad window, text editor, you save the file, you cut and you paste. <laughs> or you take and you load the file, I'll show you how to load the file in. So you can create 20 tables in two seconds. Otherwise you have to sit there and type the stuff in. Not so good. So. I'll go over that in a lot more detail and start typing stuff in. Type in exit to leave the window. It's interesting, actually, that I have to say this, because if you leave the window open, you've left the connection open. So I've already told you Windows, I've already told you Express version only supports one simultaneous user. So you got the window open. It's not letting me connect. It's not letting me connect. You spent hours trying to figure out what's wrong with your database, check the services. Check the... Oh, it's because you left the little window open. You're already connected. It's not going to let you connect again. I believe actually they fixed that because the other day I was playing around with 11G and I had three windows open and they were all working. So either there's a problem with it, they don't know about it yet, <laughs> or um, they fixed it. I don't know. Oracle Help Resources. Eh, I don't know if I'd go to this actually. I think I would just rather just do a Google search. Oracle is very popular. You can find help about Oracle all over the place. So. All right, I'm going to end the lecture at this point. We're on slide number 53. I'm actually not going to cover the rest of it, but I'm going to summarize it real quickly for you. Because um, this is kind of a lot of a repeat of what we're going to see next week when we start looking at the boot camp stuff. Anyway, for those of you who don't know what the word boot camp means, intense SQL, SQL after SQL after SQL constantly for three lectures straight, um, which is pretty intense actually. Um, we do have what's called a dictionary. It keeps track of everything. I believe your system files, your dictionary, and everything's going to be empty on that express version. Um, you can query the dictionary and get certain things like what privileges exist and what, uh, what profiles have been set, what users exist. So what ends up happening is when you install it, you get the system account. system keeps track of a bunch of tables. One of the tables is the dictionary, the other one is the user accounts, the other one is a list of all database objects. Everything in Oracle is stored in the format of a table. So in order to actually, as a DBA, in order to actually see what your users have done, what your activity, you query the tables. And the dictionary is one of them, the user tables for user accounts, for views, for sequences, and I'll talk about all that stuff as we go through it. And I probably will just demonstrate it for you because I think it'll be a little bit easier as well. Um, I thought it was like 63 slides on here. Yep, there is. Okay, good. 
I kind of thumbed through it really quickly. Um, don't worry about it. Download it. It's Lecture 2B. You can take a look at it. And uh, what, what essentially this lecture is going to show you is, um, you know, a preview of everything that we're going to see. It's kind of like the preview of the object concept. And uh, all right, so next week and next Monday, we are actually going to look at SQL from the beginning. I like the fact that most of you are here and you're showing up. We are taking attendance at every class meeting. Um, so make sure that you actually sign the attendance roster and uh, get your name into the system. And uh, hold on one second. I, just, I want to stop my uh, 